Hello, everybody. It's Perry just stopping in here at the top of the episode to let you know what this episode's all about. It's a fun little interview that I got to do with some of the folks from the Bardstown Bourbon Company. So happy to have had them back on the show. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. We get to talk about all the things that are going on with the company right now and the future and just just a fun, it's just a fun little 45-minute conversation. I will be back, though, at the end to go over tips and bits and to do social media plugs and all that good stuff. But I will let past Barry take it away. So enjoy this episode and cheers, y'all. <laughs> to another episode of This Is My Bourbon Podcast. I'm your host, Perry. I am so excited this week to be sitting down once again with the fine folks from the Bardstown Bourbon Company, good friends of the show. Had them on a couple times before. Um, I will let everybody go around the table again and introduce yourselves just for the sake of, uh, of voice recognition, though. So Thanks, Perry. It's uh, This is David Mandel, president and CEO of the Bardstown Bourbon Company. We're thrilled to have you back. I'm thrilled to be back. This is uh, Dan Calloway, Director of the Visitor's Experience and Product Development here. And Steve Nally, uh, Master Distiller with Barstown Bourbon Company. And John Hargrove, uh, Vice President of Manufacturing Operations here. I keep getting your title wrong. I keep saying you're one of the Master Distillers, so I'm going to stop saying that now. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Well, we uh, started out sipping on a little bit of the Fusion Series from Bardstown Bourbon Company, which I had the good fortune of previewing back in February, I believe, February right. or March. Yeah, um, you were one of the first people to try it. And it was fantastic then, and it's fantastic now. And um, I, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is kind of the first in your series for what's going to be future installments as well. Of the, of the Fusion series. That's right. And when you look at the, the Fusion, I, Fusion is really an exciting product because it, uh, you know, the folks that are sitting around that table here with me are the masterminds behind it. And Fusion is a way of introducing our bourbon, some of our younger distillates, a 20% wheat and a 36% rye, into, um, into the mix with a 11 and a half year old Kentucky straight bourbon. But it allows us to begin to bring to market a really exceptional blend and tells the story of our team all working together, culinary, beverage, and distilling to make a really unique blend. And these guys did it. Yeah. The coolest thing about Fusion is uh, the different perspectives that came in, you know, and through those perspectives, some blind tastings that John Hargrove set up. 50 different options he set up to put us through blinds to pick this final blend. Yeah, and I threw in some finished product and some repeats just so I could identify who my tasters are and see how uh, some of our top-rated blinds uh, rated consistently against uh, finished products that are already out there on the market. I think what's the the most interesting about this, David, you kind of touched on it as well, was it is the fact that you did include some of your own distillate in it. And I would say that because you were taking something that has kind of this innate sweetness, even, you know, yes, one is weeded, but they're both fairly young products. I think that really is what kind of helps round out the the entire experience of this product. And I really think that this is a phenomenal bourbon, if I I must say so myself. We do, too. (laughs) (laughs) I kind of figured since it went to market, but that's good to hear as well. Yeah, and I think it's it's a different approach, and the way um, you know we really believe that blending for bourbon is kind of one of the next frontiers. I mean, we're not obviously we're not the first to do it. You've had sure. High West, you've had others, but I think again, fusion here for us is not just about fusing our products, our bourbons with an older one. It's about the fusion of this team. It's this, this distilling, culinary, beverage coming together, different perspectives. And Dan and Steve, why don't you guys just touch on that? Because the, what are the different perspectives you guys bring? Yeah, well, the the culinary perspective and the beverage perspective, adding those into the distillery perspective has been huge. And that's where I think we really benefited from having the balance between young, bright, you know, fruit forward bourbon balanced with kind of those older leather notes that you get from the 11 mm. and a half year. Because you guys on the culinary and the beverage side, what are you looking for? 
We're looking for that balance. We're looking for a balance between different flavor profiles. Same way you'd make a steak, put a little lemon on top for some zip. Same way you'd balance a cocktail. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's how we, we approach it. Well, and I think that approach is totally different from what's been used in the past. You know, it's primarily been the distilling team that's uh, looked at this on a, on a taste flavor profile. And with the beverage team and the culinary team involved in it, you get their perspective, their thoughts on, you know, how this product would pair with food or how it would, how it would work in a cocktail. You know, so you've got a, a broader view, and that relates to the consumer who's looking at it the same way. So knowing that there is kind of that end product or end idea that it would eventually be paired with, with some kind of dish, how does that influence you as you're, you're building these mash bills, as you're building a flavor profile uh, from the ground up, really? Well, it gives you a view that, uh, you know, this is not just going to be something that's neat or on ice. Uh, it's something that's going to be used in a much broader uh, spectrum of things as far as cocktails, foods, you know, that I really don't think bourbon has been looked at that direction too much. I think it's kind of a new vision that, you know, we're kind of implementing to to go in that direction to, to get it to fill a, a broader spectrum of, of uses. Dan, do you kind of find uh, the opportunity to work with them, collaborate with them from the ground up as well? Oh, it's, it's a dream come true. I mean, just to to, to talk with them every day. Uh, we I'm over there looking at the, the distillery side, and then the coolest thing is they come over and try cocktails. They help pick out barrels for our barrel cocktail program. They talk about what we're doing. They'll, they'll blind taste stuff with us, and just to to have their years of experience with spirits is, is incredible. Just right in-house, just, you know, right there. Did you write that one down, John? Is a dream come true for Dan to that come over and talk to, to you? Steve. I, no, he's gonna say, I, I want, somebody's got to write Let's that go one down. We're going to bring that one back. <laughs> it's on your business card now, too. Oh, that was good. John Hargrove makes dreams come true. <laughs> That's right. I had something, but that kind of threw me off. It was so good. Um, Gosh, I can't even remember. Well, I, you know, but I'll tell you, it's one, the thing that's really exciting about it is I was amazed at the process. And, you know, it's one of those things where when we talked about doing this, and again, this kind of stuff, this developed organically. This sure. was all of a sudden, you know, we had we built this in-house culinary team and beverage team, and they just started working with the distilling team. And that's when the big idea came together. But when they sat down and we said, okay, let's, do, let's actually use this to create a product, and they ran the process – it was amazing to see the process actually work. And John, why don't you touch on that, how you did that, because I was amazed. We went through this and we we all agreed essentially on on the product right. and it was amazing. Yeah, so essentially, essentially it all started uh, to David's point organically one night here uh, after work uh, when we were teaching some of the new staff actually how to blend bourbons, blend whiskey, and then we take that same same aspect and applied it to the much larger group including the culinary team uh, and the entire beverage team at that point so over a four to five week period uh, we took the blends uh, that we had organized as a team we, we really narrowed it down to 50 if you can believe that or not it was about 52 <laughs> samples is that what we narrowed it down it. to i believe it and then each setting we would taste six to seven blind taste of these uh, blended bourbons and we'd rate them with notes we'd rate them on a nu numerical scale one through five three being average five being pretty much the white buffalo one being reject criteria yeah. so we had a numerical rating and we do a weighted average of each blind taste testing for all the personnel that was involved in the tasting at that point. And over the four to five to six weeks after introducing and reintroducing the same blinds, I was the only person that knew the exact blends. Uh, you saw a pattern develop where if I introduced the same blend that scored high in the tasting round one, it would show up in round four, round six as the top contender too. So not knowing this whole time, this whole group, not knowing I was throwing these blends back in to see if they'd score the same, the same scores that would cut, keep That's popping over and over. I was convinced John over. made this whole thing up. I mean, <laughs> but it was, it, like, until I actually saw it, it was like really, it, it was real. Yeah, so I, I'd collect all the notes, all the, all the numerical values, uh, and 
do the statistical analysis on it, the weighted average, and we narrowed it down to about four for our final tasting is when we really decided, hey, this is the number one again, which was the top in the two other two other blind tastings before that. So that's how we really narrowed it down. So it's a testament to the team here. We had people in here that really haven't been involved in tasting before. So it goes to show you that you don't have to have years of experience uh, to be a good bourbon taster. It, it amazes me, too. And I think that part of it actually kind of makes sense that there were those consistent tasting notes from round to round. And I, I start to think about, you know, just the volume of different bourbons <laughs> that we will taste in a lifetime. And... Yes, we may be able to pinpoint a couple of things here and there as identifiable, but when it comes to blinds, that's really the one of the best ways for you to understand what it is that you like, what you under, uh, to understand what it is that you're drinking as well. And I, I think that's a, a great way to have approached it. I want to ask you about something, though, because you, you touched on this very briefly. You said you brought your team in and taught them how to blend. What is your your methodology when it comes to blending then? Is it looking for certain notes that might exist in one bourbon but aren't in the other, and then you marry the two together, or is it just kind of a trial and error process? So, so the beauty about this part, I just taught them the physical um, way to actually blend. So using the correct lab equipment, graduated mm. cylinders, beakers, and other than that, I didn't want to pose any limitations or guidelines on what they're looking for. So I wanted that outside the box critiquing that what can they bring from their background in the culinary and beverage side. I don't want to influence by saying this is how you blend. So I really wanted to showcase their backgrounds and really highlight what they can bring to the table. And that really gets us outside that master blender mentality and you get new points of view from people with different backgrounds. And I think that's why we really hit it out of the out of the park with this first release of this fusion because we did have that outside the box thinking with this group with no restrictions. So Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, because, Steve, this was this was kind of a new approach, you know, for, you know, across the board. I mean, it's certainly a new approach in terms of the way distilleries traditionally do it. I mean, how did this how was this different? I think, you know, from what you've seen in the past from your from your side of things. Yeah, it is totally different. I mean, you know, usually in the past you have a, a team out of the distillery, you know, three, four or five people that would evaluate product. And then when you go to to formulating or blending barrels together the same team would would work to on most part try to create a replication of of what you already have Um, in this respect we were creating a product from the new you know a new product so we really had no basis to go on or to to revert back to so you know we were creating a product that was easily consumable and was usable in cocktails you know comparing with foods and that type of thing so by incorporating the whole team we were able to look at all points of of that it's interesting you know it's perry the one of the other parameters i thought that were interesting here is we gave the team parameters where we want to create for this one because we got fusion we got discovery with fusion we said all right we want to create something between the price point of 59 to 79 Mm-hmm. So that's that's what you're going to work with. And so that's what John and the team, they took some of the inventories that we had of Kentucky bourbon and they created blends that you'd bring out, you know, if you costed them out, would be closer to the 79 and those at the 59. And the funny thing is, hands down, each time, 59 won out. So it wasn't, about, it wasn't about cost, it was about flavor profile and how that flavor profile kind of came out. And I, I imagine that there must be some kind of catharsis behind being able to really just craft every aspect of your product from the ground up. You came from Maker's Mark, Steve, and yet, like you were saying, there was a certain flavor profile that you had to abide by. But in this case, (laughs) the world's your oyster. You can do pretty (laughs) much anything you want to with it. And I just, I, I imagine that there's a really fulfilling part behind that to step back and say, this is something that I have put firmly my fingerprint on. That's true. And, you know, uh, to back up to the product that we use, that we made, you know, you start out with a good distillate, a good clean product, then that influences the whole 
mm -hmm. whole process. And, you know, there's not very many products that you could put 60% of a two and a half year old distillate in and be good, be yeah. very good at all. And, you know, when I found out the percentages that was in it, you know, it's kind of surprising, really. I mean, you know, I knew the product was, was good, but, you know, to be able to put a 60% of a two and a half year old product is just it's pretty amazing. Let's talk to, I, I think that we might have mentioned a little bit about this on uh, the first episode that I had you guys on, but just the overall experience of the Bardstown Bourbon Company, it's not just the distillation side of it. It's not just the aging of bourbon. It is just kind of this all-in-one, feels like it's almost Napa Valley in Kentucky feeling in the, it, on these grounds. David, I don't think that I've had the opportunity yet to actually ask you why this aesthetic was important to you and your vision behind the Bardstown Bourbon Company. So what was it really that ultimately le ultimately led to the inspiration behind this? Look, you know, everything I think in this process is has been an evolution. Mm -hmm. right? And I say this often because there wasn't any one thing, any one moment that you know, particularly defined everything. We have evolved and we have changed as we've seen things develop in the marketplace. But as we did come in, we, we certainly had a clear vision for creating something different, something that stood apart. And as we began, obviously that starts with a physical structure. And sure. we wanted a physical structure that represented who we, were, who we are and who we were. And that was about being transparent. That was a, you know, a place that was about, you know, bringing kind of the modern aesthetic together um, along with, you know, really kind of tipping your hat to, you know, heritage. Sure. But, um, you know, and that's what we do across the whole facility. We balance art and science. We honor history. We push innovation. And we really believe that kind of this building and this design really captures that. We wanted something that was going to be timeless. And I think, I think yeah. we've done a good job getting there. And the team has really um, created that across the board from, from in the whole aesthetic. Yeah. How does that inspire you guys, too, in the creation of your, your whiskey products or the food that, that is served to the guests at the Bottle and Bond Kitchen or the, or the cocktails that you craft yeah. behind the bar as well? With the cocktails, I mean, uh, me and David met before there was a bar, before there was anything there. And one of the things that's always amazed me is just the freedom the team and myself has to create cocktails. Um, we can make, you know, we can just try 10 flavor profiles bring people down, see what we want to see what we want to do, see what 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 works and um there really hasn't been any restrictions on creativity and I think that's evident when you when you come to the yeah. bar and see what we're doing. Um it's it's freedom to explore. Half the things that go on in the distillery that we create that are neat, I find out about after the fact, so it's wonderful. <laughs> Talk about freedom. <laughs> Well, and this is something that uh, John's laughing. It's like, yeah, you know, yep. I, th I think the the consumer has really wanted. I mean, I've heard for years. You know, people come in and they say, "Well, where'd this come from? How's this made? What's what's involved in it?" And to some extent, a lot of that's been hidden over the years, partially because I bought, went out and, and purchased it from somebody else, and they didn't want it known who where it came from, but partially because of of antiquity that you know it's never been revealed before you sure. know when i first started in the industry pretty much everything about it was secretive you know they didn't sure. pass that information on and now it's starting to free up and to some extent we came along at pretty much the right time there was you know the visions have changed laws changed processes have changed everything's changed to allow things like this to happen so you know in some ways, we came about at the right time. But the, as David said, the vision was here to be transparent, and we're following through with that every part of the operation. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think, and uh, John will touch on this too, but I think that, you know, one of the things that really inspired us starting off was the idea of, you know, producing, really being the first distillery, um, first bourbon distillery to absolutely embrace the concept of contract production mm -hmm. and we embraced it to the extent of we made it actually a program it's our collaborative distilling program it's integrated you know we do custom whiskey production for 24 different companies for great brands and we give them the ability to make this their home you know and Absolutely. they are truly our partners but that collaborative spirit 
flows through the distillery. It flows into the bar. It flows into the restaurant. We've got you know a program with the State Department. We have culinary students from you know from four or five different international countries that come here. We house them. We provide transportation, educational experience, you know, to our products. Where we have a whole collaborative series where we work with others. So, the, the themes run through everything. And John, you know. Uh, you know, runs our manufacturing operation. He is the opportunity to work with all of these great other distilling companies. And Steve, and I mean, you can talk about that, John. I mean, what we learn and and how that you know makes us better. Yeah. So I think a part of our success here here is leveraging uh, experts in the field, leveraging technical teams that we work with, leveraging our own experience in the uh, in the distillation industry. I mean, every operator you see out there on our floor uh, today, tonight, tomorrow, they all came from distilleries. So for a distillery to start up in 2016 and be on track to produce 7 million gallons of 41 mash bills, it's just not um, uh, a capital um, um, machinery investment, it's a human capital investment also. So we very much leverage every single operator out there, the knowledge they bring to the table. And on the innovation side, you said the, the business model really drives innovation. On product side, yes, but also on continuous improvement side of our process. So every day we're, we're, we're out there, we're listening to our folks, how can we continually improve uh, every single day we hear, we're here and that manifests itself into the distillate that's coming off of our uh, both of our stills every day, I believe. And I feel like that is, I, I can at least testify to the quality of the distillate that's come out so far, um, not just in the, the the Fusion series, but I'm fortunate enough to be friends with Chad Perkins of It's Bourbon Night, and he was here a couple of weeks ago with um, Scotch and Time, mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about the, the rye pick that they're, they're working Surprise on. Surprise pick. That's right. I, I had $100 on a different one. <laughs> you sure did. You were betting 36 rye. Yeah, I was betting 36 rye. Yeah. I think we all were, actually. Yeah. I think unanimous. But it, I, Chad had a, had a little sample bottle of it, and the other day I was fortunate enough to try it. Let me just say some of the best two-year rye and some of the best 95.5 rye I've ever had. I, I was saying this the other day. People need to get into 95.5 rise or 100% rise because I oh, think we do both well yeah and <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that I think that they are so much more approachable than people give them credit for mm -hmm. I don't think that they are nearly as over the top spicy as some people would assume I think that there is such a delicate balance between the spice and those really rich baking flavors baking notes um, that that come through on them and Again, at two years old, I think that it's a true testament to how good they can be and how good what you guys are doing here. Yeah, and the rye, a lot of people don't want to um, produce rye for a couple reasons, but I think the main reason how difficult it is to produce rye. Uh, so we tried to improve the process. Uh, we fought from day one trying to get this product to where it's at today, and we think we've nailed it down on a manufacturing side um, as, as far as producing this uh, on a daily basis if we need to, on the 95s, the 100s, and pretty much anything when you get in the rye whiskey category from 51% up at that point. Yeah. Um, we, we've, we've truly embraced the process, and we've accepted the challenge, and we continually improve on it each time we run it. Are you all running rye every day? Not every day. We're not. How, how often do you normally? Every quarter. So, okay. Yeah, wow. Every three months, but we'll, we'll do a, a pretty large percentage every quarter of our rye volume pretty awesome uh let's talk too about uh the the collaboration side of what you all do and i want to talk specifically of course about the collaboration series mm. which started out as what you guys were doing with copper and kings and uh, you know the the most recent release uh, was the pfeiffer pavit reserve how did that kind of come to be where what were the origins of that sure as well uh, you know and the funny thing is there's so much to come here this is one of those things that we're really excited about because we we really think that this not only demonstrates where kind of the innovation side, a lot of what we're doing uh, from product development standpoint, but um, where the industry is going to and where how you're bringing new people and new customers into bourbon. And so it started all over dinner with us and Joe Heron at, Cop at Copper and Kings about four years ago. Uh, Steve, Brandon O'Daniel, myself, Joe Heron had the idea to do some fun things together and we created really two beautiful products. Um, it was a, you know, obviously a, a bourbon finished, 21% rye bourbon, 
finished uh, in uh, Muscat Mistel barrels and American brandy barrels. And we did a super long finish, 18 months, and then it kicked off the idea of why don't we make this a series and let's tell this really deep, authentic story about two great companies, artists working together. That's what led to the partnership with Suzanne Pfeiffer Pavitt, a great winemaker out of Napa Valley. We have three more coming out with Copper and Kings at the end of the year. We have a double Muscat, which is a triple barrel product. Oh my gosh. That's unbelievable. That's exciting. Apple Brandy. We have a um, Distillare Orange Curacao. We have a really exciting one with Prisoner Wine. Coming out oh. the beginning. Uh, it's a big one. It's in the, okay. the warehouse now. It's been, All right. uh, been finishing over a year. Um, <laughs> Armagnac, Armagnac, rum, great, Goodwood Brewing Company. Oh my gosh! Um, but these, I think, the secret, and uh, you know, let them touch on it. What we have found is being patient and doing a super long finish. We do eighteen months on everything, whereas a lot of these other finishes are six, sometimes less. Sure. Si- the product dramatically changes over that period of time and so just the absolute attention to detail in every aspect well it's something that we've kind of as david said uh grown into you know we started out talking with uh joe and brandon and you know kind of developed uh when we did the the finish with suzanne uh you know we kind of evaluated the product uh, we would go back. We got her input into it, you know, to see what how she thought it was finishing. And, you know, when you get to about a year, uh, it starts to kind of come around. But we didn't feel it was where it needed to be at that time. So we just kept letting it go. And we would go back about every month, a couple of weeks or so, try it again. And we got to the point that, you know, 18 and a half months, we thought this is where we think it needs to be. And as David said, you know, we – it appears to us that a lot of time finishes are rushed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you get some flavor, but you don't get the, the actual uh, marriage together of the two products to, to really evaluate or to uh, enhance each other's flavors. So, you know, pretty much all of ours are going around that 18-month period anymore. And, you know, we, we get the chance to, since we've launched this program, to talk with a lot of different um, producers, you know, beers, wines, a whole lot of things, and, you know, we can kind of select, and we've had a few that we've started or kind of looked into a little bit, and what we were getting wasn't what we were looking for, so we kind of scratch them, and, you know, it gives us the ability to select what we want to work with and what we think is going to make a good product. Yeah, and uh, I've heard a rumor with this Pfeiffer Pavit that there's a barrel or two Still aging, two barrels at really? 24 months. Where'd you hear that? I don't know. I, I pick up things. <laughs> I'm big, curious that's about a, that. It, that's big breaking news update. <laughs> I'm gonna have to pick my jaw to, up off the but floor. It's interesting because because that you are the first one to know that. Seeing basically, I, I feel like seeing how far we can go with these finishes exactly. and really finding that sweet spot with a Cabernet finish. Um, you know, exploring. At, Jeez, Where does it go? It go? I, yeah. I haven't stopped smiling since you said that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we can go pull it. Nobody has ever felt that way about you. <laughs> uh, it's a little Woo, too close deep to home. Cuts. <laughs> deep cuts here on this I can tell you what's podcast. really funny about this is because there's this great, like, inherent contradiction in us. And it's sort of, you look at, we're talking about being patient here, right? Yeah. Because patience, you know, we're patient, we're making great products we're not putting on anything out till they're ready but of course when you look at us there's nothing patient about us at all right <laughs> on the other hand right, we built this place in three years we opened up a restaurant a bar the seventh largest distillery in the country so on the one hand we're super fast we are moving we're seeing opportunities and at the same time we're telling you you got to be patient <laughs> and that is one of these wonderful contradictions in the company and it's true when it comes to the products patience you know, making great things, if you take great people and you take great ingredients, 99% of the time you're going to come up with something really good. And I think that's what we see with this collaborative series. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not rocket science to say we're going to take these two amazing things, we're going to yeah. put them together, and we're going to watch it. And guess what? So far, all of them have really been beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, to that point, too, I think you guys did something really smart in – launching the, uh, the the contract distilling side of it, too, instead of just putting out vodkas or gins or stuff that everybody else is doing. 
you know, this way, you know, you can kind of introduce people to your brand without putting a stamp on what that brand may look like. Well, the funny thing is when we first met and Steve joined us when we started the company in 2013, it was one of the first discussions we had. And we, we, we had that. And, you know, Steve had come off Wyoming whiskey and you can tell that story about, you know, how it was, you know, a little bit, probably a little earlier than, than you had wanted it to be released when they put it out. And we had that discussion. We said, you know what? We're not putting anything out too early. We're not making vodka and gin. We're going to make good bourbon. Uh, and we're going to make sure that we we don't do anything until it's ready. Don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, think th- I think those were the words. Well, I mean, you know, the same theory when, when I started Wyoming Whiskey, you know, we're going to wait. We're not going to do it anything crazy. And year three and a half, you know, they started to get strapped a little bit for cash flow. You know, they need to have some incomes. We've been spending, building the facility, uh, getting it up and going, operations for three years. And then they come around and, you know, hey, we're getting low on cash. We need to release something. Well, don't do it yet. And in reality, they were only six months premature. If they'd waited another six sure. months, they would have had a decent product. But, you know, cash flow means a lot. <laughs> But you know, cash moves everything around me. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm gonna stay I'm gonna stay off the record on Wu-Tang. this one, but I agree with you. It it could have been a little bit older. John, you acted like you had something you really wanted to uh, say. No comment for me. <laughs> I trust Steve's judgment. That's why we work well together. This is good. This is good uh, radio. I'm here. enjoying you know, this. You got, yeah. you got to go with it. You yeah. got to put that on. I want to talk to you about the the cocktail that came about as a result of the Pfeiffer Pavit Reserve. Yeah. The Moxie. Well, that's a funny story because it's. Um, you better tell the whole story. Well, the mo- the story on the Moxie is. We can talk about much, we're breaking all we're sorts breaking of stories and we can talk about who Suzanne was mad about the it's wine very being in there. Oh, that's a, it. <laughs> a traditional it's it's I, I can't even say riff on a New York sour. It is a New York sour. Sure. We sent it off. I thought it was amazing. The beverage team thought it was amazing. Well, it just tell us worked. what it is. Well, it's the base is a Cabernet finished bourbon. So when you have a Cabernet finished bourbon, I mean the New York sour with the Cabernet top. The lemon zip, little sweetness, cane sugar, and then you use the Napa cab to float on top. Yeah. So in that description, two large issues if you're a Napa wine producer. <laughs> One is you're using a Napa finished cab in a cocktail. The other is that you're pouring. And it's not just a Napa finished cab. It's, it's her it's reserve. Her, well, yeah. It is her, her reserve, reserve. The finest wine she makes. You can't get it but on a private yeah. list, right? And we're topping a cocktail with it. We're topping it. But it a, is amazing. It's and so we sent it to her. I thought it, we all thought it was incredible. And uh, maybe we could have presented it in a more uh, articulate manner than just picture, email, recipe, <laughs> zip it over. And uh, she said, absolutely not. And she was offended, mortified, flummoxed. Yeah, it was one of those, you know, how, how, can you, how can you possibly do this to the wine? And it was, it was great because we just let it sit. And I talked to Suzanne. I said, you know, just have your team. Have your team try it. And I she said, fine. I have my team try by, it. Two days go by. Ooh. Suzanne called back and she said, you know what? The team loves the cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good, right? I mean, that's the thing is it's good. And that was a funny thing. And, you know, we made it and we used that cocktail. That was the cocktail for the launch party. So it was the Pfeiffer Pavic Cabernet Bourbon under the collaborative series with her wa- her reserve, reserve wine. I mean, it, and talk about a decadent cocktail, right? This oh, is, it was fantastic. It is a decadent it's, cocktail. Um, and, uh, I had, I, I it, had it that that uh, that day that we had the the preview for all right. the products that were coming I mean, out this year. It was floated and with a two hundred dollar Cabernet. Uh-huh. It's, I mean, it, it's it great. better be good. It's, it's great. great. <laughs> it's great. And so Suzanne, you know, realized that you know, like most of the time, we're right. And so <laughs> I hope she's listening because I hope so too. We're not always right. <laughs> But that, that was something I think that was so interesting and, and really is something that you don't see a whole lot of people do is indeed no. take a $200 bottle of wine and it's hop a, a hop financially a smart decision, no. but it tasted incredible <laughs> for the, just, you know, for the launch, for the release. We want to make something special for her. So we did that. It was good. I dream of it often, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's shift into talking now about the Discovery Series. Uh, what I would say, 
is maybe my favorite out of the three. Mm, fair <laughs> enough. Um, when we first talked about this back in February, I was wondering what the future of this product was going to be like. I think I actually asked you, John, about it as well, whether or not Discovery Series was going to maintain a similar blend or if it was going to constantly be changing. Um, and kind of the same thing with the Fusion. Was the Fusion going to be something that eventually may have been obsolete because you were only doing your product and then it just became Bardstown, Com Bardstown Bourbon Company bourbon, right? So what is the future so far of Discovery Series looking like? I think the process was replicated what you saw on Fusion, how we came to the conclusion of this particular blend in our first Discovery release. So we utilize the three teams again, our culinary team, our beverage team, and our distillation team. And we have a great stock and inventory of aged bourbons and young bourbons. So we had a plethora of different ages, different mash bills, different origins that we were really able to test with and narrow down to this final blend that you see in front of you today. So as far as where it's going to go in the future, we may have an idea, but I guarantee you anybody at this table cannot tell you what's going to be in Discovery Bottle 2 right now, what's going to be in Discovery Bottle 3, likewise with Fusion Release 2, Fusion Release 3. But I can tell you those efforts are already underway right now. Oh, good. And it will be blind, so... Good. Yeah. Even if you had an idea, <laughs> we'll see how it turns and that, out. I think that's one of the things that's really exciting and fun about the industry right now, where is it's about bringing out new things and different things. And the consumer can be a huge fan of the Bardstown Bourbon Company, but not necessarily for the same reasons that maybe our grandfather was, you know, loved his favorite sure. bourbon and never wanted to see it change. I think we're seeing consumers in this category um, really look for things that are different, they want innovation, but they'll stay with a company, for example. They'll gravitate towards Bardstown Bourbon Company because they know we're about quality. They know we're about making great things, and they want to try all of them. And so yeah. the brand becomes, you know, kind of a, a meshing of all those different products. And ultimately, yes, we'll have core products that come from here that will be kind of staples. But in the meantime, and even as we get in the future... We plan to just keep trying and experimenting and giving the consumer lots of different things because they're looking for it. What do those core products kind of look like in your mind? Are, are there certain things that you might want to be aiming for as you're developing them? Is it, you know, sure, it may be based on uh, a certain flavor profile, but from a business standpoint, I mean, it's got to be an accessible price point too, right? Well, I think, you know, how that develops um, remains to be seen. And so I wouldn't want to put any stake in the ground now. Sure. Um, because I think, you know, well, this is what we know right now. You know, like everything, again, we're three years old. Right. A year ago, there was nothing in this room. You know, there is now what has been called the best restaurant in the state of Kentucky, right? And so I would say that's what you can expect from us. Um, there's going to be constant change, constant evolution. You know, down the road, yeah, there'll be core products here. What are they going to be? Well, we obviously, we've got some really great, we have some wheats, some rice, but we're making all different things. What does that look like several years from now? We don't know. We really don't know. But, you know, stay tuned because this group is going to figure it out. I want to talk to you about the proof of Discovery Series. It's 121.21. Nothing to sniff at in terms of the proof. How much did you go through testing-wise once you had found something that worked and something that everybody agreed on? Like, how much did you go back and forth between, like, maybe we'll add a little bit of water here, maybe we, you know... So we were really wanted this Discovery Series to really truly represent cast strength. So cast strength carries its own weight with consumers. We really d didn't want to change the proof when it came out of the barrel and with the blends that we had. When we tasted it, we tasted it at cast strength, and we all agreed by the scores through the process that that was the best proof to go to was that cast strength right there, and it proofed out at 121.21. I mean, it's non-chill filtered, it's raw. And everything in the you know, Discovery Series, Collaborative Series, you know, we intend to put out at cast strength. I think what Fusion is, you know, right at that hovers, right at that hundred, you know, proof mark. But, um, but uh, you know, the cast strength is a really interesting category for, especially for the bourbon enthusiast. Mm -hmm. I go ahead. Dave. Oh no, and with that cast strength, it's very interesting when you have a bottle to have a couple pours 
and experiment with where it where it rings out at 121 or, or put a little water, put it down to 115. It really has different personalities there. I think we wanted the consumer, kind of a discerning bourbon consumer, to experience that. And that's why we sure. put it out up there. From your side too, Dan, um, have you experimented much with the Discovery Series at Cast Strength in cocktails? <laughs> Only by myself for my own enjoyment. <laughs> uh, uh, honestly, I think I will tell you one of the greatest cocktails ever made is a Discovery Old Fashioned. Uh, it's incredible because it's got that complexity. It's got that five year that can cut through on a cocktail. There's nothing like it. I, I, if you can spare, you know, I like everyone likes to sip it neat. If you want to just put two ounces in an Old Fashioned, you will not regret it. I'll give it a shot later. <laughs> yeah, and the goal, I mean, again, the parameters with Discovery, like, you know, when we talked about Fusion, we said 59 to 79. There were no parameters with Discovery. It was, here are our inventories. So on this one, you know, we used 13, 11 and a half year old, 10 and 5. You know, that is all very expensive, obviously, product, especially in today's terms, uh, in terms sure. of the rarity of it. And we said to the team, Make the best blend. Just make the best blend. Let's use the art, you know, the art of blending, the three teams, and that was it. And I'll tell you, if Bardstown Bourbon Company um, had, you know, was had a, we had a little bit more runway behind us in terms of, a, you know, a name that was out there across the country, that blend would be selling for two, three hundred plus dollars. You know, at one hundred and thirty dollars, which is what we brought that out. In many ways, it's a huge deal because there are plenty of other companies that have been around a lot longer with names that are more recognizable and are coming out with that product. And it is coming out with something like that, and it would be easily over to north of $200 a bottle. Well, guys, I think we might go ahead and wrap this up here just a little bit. I want to say first and foremost, thank you all so much for letting me come back into the Bardstown Bourbon Company and chat about these fantastic products if people are a little bit on the fence about buying your products, if they haven't quite been sold yet, what's your sales pitch? What are you wanting people to know to get them to try Bartown Bourbon Company bourbon? I mean, I think first of all, what I would say um, I think on behalf of all of us is we've created tremendous credibility over a very short period of time making some of the best brands in the world. We produce everything from Jefferson's to High West here to some of the best brands in the country. And so the team here has incredible expertise and credibility, and that find its, finds its way into every one of these bottles. And so, look, you know, the products aren't cheap. Um, they're good if you can get them, you know. And so Discovery Collaborative Series are, have, you know, disappeared. Fusion Series is a little bit more availability, but give it a try. Um, and know that you've got, uh, you know, a lot of innovation and creativity that are going into these products. And you, you're going to see this company, you're going to see a lot from this company. And I'm excited for it. Can't wait. Once and again. You can get them, bardstownbourbon.com. Uh, check out where we're available. And uh, if you're in one of the states where uh, e-commerce is permitted, we work with a number of retailers <laughs> that ship all across the country to those permissible states. So check us out at bardstownbourbon.com. Awesome. David, Dan, Steve, John, thank you all so much again for sitting down with me. This has been a lot of fun. Looking forward to doing it again. Can't wait to see what else is coming out this year. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for having us. Thank you. As always, a huge thank you to the folks over at the Barnstown Bourbon Company because they have treated us so well and have been so kind to us to not only donate a lot of their time but a lot of their product as well and I just can't say enough good things about what they're doing over there and it's just uh, it, it, it's just awesome I, I love them I think that they've got something really cool going they've got a great future ahead of them as well so yeah if you have not yet gone and checked them out please do so they are a fantastic group of people and you cannot miss the bottle and bond kitchen I mean it's just just fabulous. It's just fabulous, y'all. The episode is not quite over yet, though. I do still have Tips and Bits, which is a segment where we recommend something that we have been enjoying recently. It doesn't necessarily have to be bourbon or whiskey-related. 
But this week, it is. Here's the thing, y'all. We have had such great fortune recently to enjoy 14-year-old, 13, 14, 15-year-old picks of Knob Creek single barrels. And let me tell you, they have been fantastic, but I have recently had a couple of nine-year-old picks that you should not be sleeping on. And I just want you, I, I feel like we have gotten out of that mindset of, yeah, well, nine years is fine, but it could be better. You know, we're still getting some of the 14-year-old stuff now. Listen, it's still good stuff. It's still really, really good stuff. Also, y'all know that we did a recap episode of Southern Whiskey Society last week, but if you want a more in-depth look on it, you need to go check out this week's episode of the podcast, uh, because Will and the Grease do a fantastic job uh, as they podcast live from the event. It's super fun to listen to. Part one came out this week, and part two is coming out next week. So by all means, go and check that out. You are not going to want to miss that. That does it for this week's episode of this My Bourbon Podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. If you'd like to follow me personally, I am at PRIDA 1492 on all social media channels. If you would like to follow the show, we are at My Bourbon Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can give us a five-star rate and review on iTunes. That helps other people find the show and gives us some great feedback if you have any of that for us. You can find all of our apparel and merchandise at bourbonshop.threadless.com. Lots of really cool stuff going up there, and I'm going to be updating the shop here soon. I've got some new designs in the pipeline, so be on the lookout for that. If you have questions or comments, you can also send us an email to thismybourbonshop at gmail.com. We'd love hearing from everybody. We'd, ha- uh, be, we'd be more than happy to read out your email on the show and answer some of your burning questions about what it is that we do over here at Timbip. That one was for you, John Edwards. <laughs> And last but not least, you can become a patron of the show by heading to patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can support the show and it really does help us out. There is absolutely no pressure if you cannot do it, but just know that it goes towards the creation and the time and the effort and everything that goes into making this show as much fun and as cool as it is and we really do appreciate all of the patrons who are over there right now you get great things like bonus episodes you get private chats uh, if you're on certain tiers you get group chats if you're on certain tiers so again if you'd like to support the show it's patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast the august bonus episode actually just dropped last week so go and check that out Thank you all again so much for listening. I will see you next week with another fun episode. But until then, I'm Perry, and this is my bourbon podcast.